job placement um, via the internship process. Thanks, John. Well, I have the esteemed honor today to introduce Josh McDonald, but he's our first PSP speaker in the first speaker series, so you're a pioneer. <laughs> <laughs> the pressure. <laughs> So uh, Josh's background includes getting his undergraduate degree in architecture from WSU, and then he went on to get his master's in architecture at WSU. He's worked in the profession for seven years here in Seattle at two different firms. The first six were spent at T Tiscarino yeah. Associates. It's a small architecture firm that specializes in master planning, mixed use. Most recently, he moved to Weber Thompson, where he's currently working on mixed use residential buildings. Josh is also involved in ACE, or ACE, which is a mentorship program for high schoolers who are interested in architecture, engineering, and construction. So let's welcome Josh McDonald. Wow, she stole all my guts, but I was going to talk about myself. Um, so, anyway, so yeah, so who, who here is? In, or has worked in the construction architecture industry. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see you have. Okay, quite a few. All right, cool. So you have a general understanding of what uh, what we do in architecture and that kind of stuff. And I guess I'll step back and just I will talk a little bit about myself in terms of um, moving to Seattle uh, from Pullman and. You know, I've got to do this. <laughs> uh, so, I was over there for a good a good six years and put in some good time there. Um, learned a lot and had, you know, uh, had some good experience doing some internships with um, some firms back in Olympia, you know. But um, you know, I had you know, my first six years had a great opportunity to work for a really small firm. There were two to three people um, when I first started grew to about seven people, um, and, and one of the benefits and one of the reasons why I looked to work for a small firm was I knew I was going to get that opportunity to jump into, you know, a project manager role, or just a leadership role uh, in the design process. So, uh, you know, this this project here is, is an example of a project that worked on in um, West Oregon, or East Oregon rather, in uh, Prairie City middle of nowhere, but it's a, a ranger district station. Um, and then this is another project uh, in Seattle, okay. uh, which is a mixed use project running up on top of Queen Anne. And, you know, both of these projects were, um, I think that it was unique for um, somebody to put somebody like myself in that role coming out of school not knowing hardly anything. And then saying, okay, here's a design, go. And uh, that, there's a big learning curve, and so uh, that, that was a really good opportunity for me to go from the small firm, take what I learned, to move on into uh, working for Weber Thompson. And so this is uh, this is actually the, the building where I, where Weber Thompson resides. Uh, we're in South Lake Union. Um, we are multidisciplinary architecture firm, do architecture, landscape, master planning, um, interior design. And we are right in South Lake Union, right amongst uh, all the Amazon growth and everything, and it's insane right now. All the construction is happening. Uh, it's, it's really neat to see, and especially the, the light rail to go from, or street call rather, to go from nothing, hardly any use to actually, I mean, it's packed. It's packed every day. Which is really cool to see. Um, so, you know, moving to Weber Thompson was was a great great thing. Um, they started, you know, in Seattle and went from basically a forty person firm, and then during the heyday up to hundred people, and then during the downturn back down to twenty five. So, um, and that and that happened a lot uh, all throughout the all throughout the architecture structural like one. The entire uh, development community. So now we're extremely lucky in that uh, we're basically focusing on apartment mixed use projects, and that's what a lot of what's being built right now. Uh, if you go anywhere in Seattle, you'll see cranes, and none of them are condos, they're all apartments. And uh, the, 
reason for that is that people are getting foreclosed on, they have terrible credits, and they can buy a house, so they're moving to apartments. Or in the instance of Amazon, like what we were talking about earlier, that there's so many people moving to an area that there's no need. So um, I wanted to, you know, so that's kind of a background of, of you know, myself and, and Weber Thompson, and I think to kind of tie it to what you guys are learning. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about energy codes and and how the architecture community interacts with those to, with consultants to meet the codes. And um, I'll use an example of a project I'm currently working on. Um, it's in Redmond. It's a Type Five, which Type Five construction is wood frame. So it's five floors of type five wood frame construction over one level of type one, which is concrete construction. And basically the, the first floor is the retail non-residential use and the, the five floors of residential. So what what we'll do is actually work through and figure out all our floor plans. Um, you know, we've got a program from a developer or a client and they want X amount of retail, uh, they want so many units, and they've got you know, a diversity of mixes, so they want so many two bedrooms, so many one bedrooms, so many students. So we <laughs> figure out our building envelope, massing, and start to you know, plug in, do unit layouts, do the retail layouts, and then basically we get to what I would call 50%, that's design development. And at that point, you know we've we've worked, you know, heads down architecture uh, only, trying to figure out how everything works. And then at this point, at fifty to sixty percent, it's all right. We need to talk to our consultants and start to figure out how we can make this building work. Not only from a code standpoint, um, but also from you know uh, all the mechanical systems, placement of transformers, electrical rooms, all that. Kind of so for energy code, what we'll do is we actually will send all of our drawings that we've done to date. And we have different energy code consultants that we work with. Uh, Patrick Hayes is one that lives up in the local area that's really well known. Uh, he's actually written some of the codes. And then there's you know, people like Rushing, Cezanne. These are big, big organizations that do energy, electrical systems. So, We'll send them our drawings. They'll basically take our drawings and start to say, all right, you've got this much square foot of retail. You have this much glazing in your retail, this much square foot in your residential, this much glazing in your residential. And they basically start to generate a model. They'll actually build a model um, from our AutoCAD and figure out where where we need to put different walls in place. So in the upper floors, you know, we've got a lot of, you know, it's all wood frame. So how do we insulate our walls enough to meet the energy code? And you know, similar down in the retail level, if we've got a concrete wall, you know, you can't just have a concrete wall with you know, cold side uh, and warm side. You need to have some kind of insulation in there. And so we'll go through and, and actually look at different floor assemblies and wall assemblies. And to make sure that when he's when they're making that building model that we're meeting the energy code. So this this project that I'm working on is in Redmond. So it's a Washington State Energy Code. And um, Washington State Energy Code is you know quite a bit more strict than a lot of the other state jurisdictions. Um, which is a good thing. But um, so we, we'll go through and, and look at different wall assemblies and floor assemblies and figure out, okay, we can't put insulation here. So let's, I guess if I go back, so here's a great example. So I've got a ramp that's coming up here. And I can do, I can do so much, you know, R28 insulation, which is a thicker insulation at one point. But as you come up the ramp, you have limited head height here. So you actually need to have a thinner insulation. So you've got an R28 at this location and an 
R28 at that location. So what's the difference? It's, it's a thinner profile insulation. It's more expensive. But it's necessary so that we can, cars can eat the rest of that kind of stuff. So that seems like kind of mundane stuff, but all that stuff, there's different trade-offs that we work with our energy code consultant to make sure that we're meeting our code. Um, I guess another, you know, so here, this is a, a concrete or CMU wall. We're basically at a, at a stair. And we're having to add some rigid insulation in here because the garage is essentially a cold space, the stair is a, a heated space. So we need to add this so that we can get enough points to meet our energy code. So <coughs> in terms of how architects work with energy code consultants, um, that, that's essentially how it works. There's a lot of back and forth. They generate a building model based on our AutoCAD. <clears throat> and, and then we start to figure out, okay, we need to add a thicker wall here because the insulation isn't going to fit. Otherwise. So um, there's, there's a couple, there's basically five different, um, five different tiers for the energy code. So there's, there's essentially the, the baseline building, which is the industry standard. Uh, that would be um, any building that's constructed now has to meet, you know, a state energy code. <clears throat> and then there's the Seattle Energy Code, which is, an, you know, the next step down. Then we have the 2030 Challenge, which is essentially each five years they're slowly trying to get to a uh, net zero building, basically. There's the Building, building Challenge, uh, which is essentially a building that uh, can basically sustain itself off the grid. And then there's a net positive building. And essentially that is a building that not only is off the grid, but it can tap into the grid to give energy back to the grid. And actually, um, I've heard instances where people you know, are making money or getting credits towards um, you know, their utilities or whatever. So how does, you know, so based on those five tiers, we can just kind of go through the five tiers. And, and we'll start, you know, let's just call this a baseline industry standard building. And um, basically CVEX, uh, CE, it's a commercial building energy consumption survey. We'll go around the United States and survey uh, these industry standard buildings to see, you know, how, how are they doing for energy consumption? Um, you know, what type of mechanical systems are they using? What type of windows do they have? It, you know, all that is starting to impact uh, you know, loss of heat and energy essentially from the building. And so seed bags will go through every three to five years, depending on the funding, of course. The last one, I think, was 2007. So they're going to do one next year. But essentially, this is, this is, once they go around and do the, the, stand, the surveys, that kind of sets the bar for the industry standard. So the next, I guess, I should step back. On top of that, um, see how AIA is doing something. AIA is the um, Architectural Association. Um, and they're actually going through and doing surveys of buildings, surveys of architects to see what types of buildings that are developing. So are they doing the buildings? Are they doing, you know, uh, are they just meeting the industry standard? Uh, you know, and, and how how that's impacted by the owner. So the uh, CLAIA is, is actually, you know, moving forward and trying to figure that out as well, which is, which is helpful. Um, so then going from the building, the industry standard, down to the Seattle Energy Code, uh, Seattle Energy Code is, um, it's funny, I, you know, we were just meeting with a contractor yesterday on this, on this project that I'm working on. And they have, they have continually have a lot of questions and their jaw drops because of the amount of insulation that goes into the project, the type of windows that we're having to use, um, and, and the materials because it's, it's adding a considerable cost to their construction. And 
what's happening is the owner is saying, well, hey, why is why is my project so expensive for you know when you're bidding it? I need you to cut a lot of money on this. And so the contractor's coming to us and saying, well, what the heck, why do we have this much, much insulation here? Why do we need why do we need insulation between a stair and a garage? It doesn't seem like that's really why. And the answer is our energy code consultant has gone through, has generated a building model, and we're you know right on the cup of meeting it. I mean, we're talking about bumping the windows up by you know, 0.01 for our rating, just or you rating, just so that we can meet the code. And so we literally can't take anything out. And so that's kind of what's spurring this industry standard to, to slowly bump up, and it's it's changing the cost for uh, developers. But they, but the return because of the energy code is, is well. So Seattle Energy Code is 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 a next step down from the industry standard or the or the state energy code, and they're they're pretty uh, they're pretty strict. So even in between the city of Redmond and the city of Seattle, it's there's there's a big difference. Um, city of Seattle has three different ways they oops, has three different ways they look at it. Uh, there's a prescriptive option. Uh, component and then an annual energy analysis. And essentially, the component is, is what 90% of people that are submitting for permit use. Uh, the quantum method basically, because we have this mismatch of floor assemblies, wall assemblies, they actually have to take all these different things and pull them together and calculate it out. Yeah. Is that <coughs> also like a trade off? Like we can't do this to this, so we'll make this one really, really good. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and you know, another great example of this this building that I'm working on, we have one area where we've got a retail space, and it's a concrete deck above with the residential. And the decks for those apartments sit right on the, sit right on the deck of the retail space. So what the energy code is saying is, Okay, we basically got an exterior deck space from the apartment level, which is concrete, down into the retail level. So there is coal that's bridging the concrete into this warm space. So we're actually just adding insulation in an area, in one area where these decks are over the retail space to meet the requirement. I mean, it seems really silly, and a lot of these things you look at it and it just Kind of doesn't quite make sense, and that's that's one thing that's changing. And then, um, another great example is um, where we've got you know a concrete wall, and you need to put insulation in there. Basically, we'll use a, a metal stud to fur out the wall and put the insulation in there. Well, the metal stud actually bridges the cold from the concrete into the warm space. So then the code is actually changing to make that more difficult. So you'll have to use a, you know, a wood a wood stone as opposed to uh, steel. Yeah. Um, you were talking a few minutes ago about the glazing and maybe adjusting the U factor. Is your firm doing anything to actually encourage people to reduce the size of the glazing, since that is the majority of your loss in space for day? It. My first answer is no. Okay. Um, I guess an example um, is, you know, in an apartment you want as much light as you can get, and these apartments are so deep now. Um, some apartments that I'm looking at right now are called open one bedrooms. So basically, they're it's like a studio except they're really long, and they have a, a cubby hole for a bed, basically that's back in the unit. And so, you know, when you've got a 38 foot deep unit, you really need Try and get as much light, natural light, in there as you can, and uh, it's really, it's really interesting. And some of these units are uh, 550 square feet, and uh, that's becoming an industry standard you know, for a lot of apartments. Um, the average, the average used to be about 700 to 750, um, you know, a number of years back, and now we're seeing that the, that the average unit size is anywhere from 600 to 600. Uh, what was 
a one, one project I worked on as a Queen Anne was a 400 square foot apartment that was running for $1,200 a month. But that's Queen Anne. Yeah, yeah. So it's a little bit different. But uh, anyways, let's. So in terms of glazing, we, yeah. So let's let's get back to that. Uh, so when you do have a lot of glazing, the, what you have to do is basically start to look at all right. You now you need to have argon filled glazing. Um, you need to have um, special tints to the window. Uh, you need to you know really uh, you know increase the heat down. Yeah. And and basically with that. What that means, you know, and so the so the developer it's, you know says, all right, I want as much window space as I can get. All right, what are you going to pay for it? Yeah, yeah, in all kinds of ways, like having to insulate your stairwells. Right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, some of the, yeah, there, there's all kinds of different things that uh, different trade-offs, uh, and, and I'll get to this in a second, but um, we'll talk about lead and, and lead. What owners think of that? Um, so the next, the next tier down is uh, the 2030 challenge, <coughs> and the 2030 challenge. I don't know if any of any of you have heard of it. Um, it's something that um, you know is, is uh, I guess, going. I don't know. It's it, it's essentially ahead of the Seattle Energy Code, and it's what people sign on to for various projects to, to meet different. Different prestige, basically. So, for instance, the project the building that I work in right now, we met the uh, 2030 challenge for today. Uh, we are 60% carbon um, tax, and each every five years, basically, that you know is going to change. So the the goal is that we'll be carbon neutral by 2030. That building. No, no, so no, just industry construction like, standards. Like every five years? Yeah, yeah no, <laughs> no, no, yeah. So, so we're basically meeting it for today. Um, in you know, by 2015, if you want to meet the 2030 challenge, then your requirement is to be set. So the product you'll be building during that 2015. Yeah, exactly. Crazy expensive. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's you know it's getting extremely expensive and and you know. The Washington Code, and Seattle Code, are slowly getting tougher and tougher because the industry standard is changing. So that baseline building that I talked about a little bit, you know, the, uh, is, you know, the industry standard is all right. We're, we need to use this type of insulation. We need to use these different materials. And so that's slowly when when CBEC goes back through and does their surveys, I think they're going to find that. Newer construction is changing and actually becoming more sustainable and carbon neutral, um, just 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 purely by you know the industry standards. And so what that's doing is forcing the CO code and this to, to move forward. Yeah, One, two questions. What's the current uh, Seattle code in terms of uh, percent? I think Seattle code now is twenty percent. Wow. Quite a jump from 20 to 60. And then, uh, does carbon neutral does that take into account the energy sources in the Pacific Northwest, or what do they mean by carbon neutral? I guess you know if you're using electricity and 60% electricity is generated by you know, sure carbon neutral sources, is that um, is that factoring at all, or it's just saying it's, carbon it's, neutral it's, is it's it's mostly on site. And, and materials actually go into it. Um, you know where you get your materials, how they're harvested. Um, you know that that actually is something similar to this, where it's got. You know, by the end, hopefully, the materials that we're using are 50% recycled or 75% recycled, as opposed to you know uh, using growing trees as a, the opposite end of the spectrum. So. Um, so the twenty, so the twenty thirty challenge, basically, yeah, it, it, it moves up. It's it's not an easy thing to to meet. Um, you know, I think, but it, it's a good. I mean, I'll talk about our office building a little bit, but um, it, it's worth it in the long run in terms of cost for energy and um, you know heat and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so.
so so this is again this is just the, the building that we got the, the challenge. So um, I guess I'm not so talking about since it's here. Um, so this building basically there used to be a project, there was an old, old warehouse that sat on the site. Pearl Jam used to practice at this site. Um, they were all old, old, uh, old warehouse on the site. We had to knock it down to, to build this. 95% uh, of the uh, construction, the demolition was able to be recycled. Um, not only by just recycling the materials in terms of you know, using the wood for compost or uh, wood chips, anything like that, but actual Pearl Jam fans coming. <laughs> <laughs> we actually, uh, we have a, a wall uh, that we actually took a bunch of the old uh, wood floorboards and have this cool, cool wood floorboard. So when I came in to interview, they said, you see that wall right there? Pearl Jam, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, man, I want to work here. <laughs> so anyway. Um, so this this project, um, you know, I'll, I'll hit some of the highlights. Uh, it's, it's one of the first buildings. Uh, it is the first building, one of the first buildings in the city of Seattle currently that is not using air conditioning. So all of our ventilation comes from operable windows. Um, we have. Let's see. Let's see I get too short, but let's see. So we have these louvers here. They basically have carbon monoxide sensors, and when the carbon monoxide gets too high, the louvers open up and bring in fresh air. Um, I've actually been sitting, sat in meetings where um, it sounds like it's really where it goes. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know what the hell it was, and they finally told me that it was the louvers, and it's it's amazing, you know, you'll be sitting in this room and getting hot and the clients drilling you and then you hear the and it's like all the you know the fresh air comes in and it's it's great. It really is it is amazing. Um, and if it gets too hot and you're you know you can open up a window. Yeah. Are there fans associated with those uh, that air coming in? There's not. So the so the way the, the building was designed is is it's a uh, it's a donut shape and what happens is the Actually, is sucked into the central invention. I mean, convection. Right, exactly. So the air will actually come in through the louvers or through the windows and exit through this donut hole shaft that goes up and out. So the natural ventilation. It's a, it's a great thing. Um, you know, some of the other highlights are um, when it gets too sunny, these automatically, these sunshades automatically come down will open and close according to how bright it is. Um, the, all the toilets and urinals are you know, low, no flow basically except the toilets. Um, we use 30% less water by doing that. Um, I, so this, is, this kind of pertains back to the, the energy code consultant and building the model. Uh, you know, for this project, we wanted to make sure that we were going to be okay without having AC in the summer. And when they went through their model, they basically determined that, you know, for 18 to 20 hours, the temperature will climb above 80 degrees in the facility. That's over the entire year. So that's, you know, very, you know, you know very distinct days, times where that is going to happen. And basically, the, the platform of the offices. If it gets hot, just wear shorts that day. <laughs> Open the windows, get the... the uh, um, in terms of heating, uh, we've got a, it's a hydronic uh, hot water heaters, and you can see them here. So essentially these, these heaters right here are right next to the windows, so uh, you know when these are closed, and a lot, you know, we lose a lot of heat gain from the glazing, you know. And so it's important, you know, all these uh, heaters are located adjacent to the window, so it's kind of in the space. Um, this, this building is unique. Um, in the, for the city of Seattle, 
if, if you were to do the component versus the, the building model, so those are one of those two options. Um, the, the component works for this project because we can cheat, because we can do insulation in certain places, and we can increase our um, shading and all that kind of stuff. Um, whereas the building model will look at it and say, all right, we've got these louvers up here. Those are leaking cold into the space. Not very much, but the model will basically designate that and say, all right, we've got an issue here. How are we going to fix it? So that's one of the issues with moving from the component or prescriptive where you're actually you know, writing and figuring out the energy code as opposed to presenting an actual building model to a city jurisdiction. Because the, the city will say, all right, well, you're losing a lot of you're losing a lot of heat right here. Why is that and how are you going to meet it? So it, it's that's one of the these things is the energy code is changing um, how we get permitted and that kind of stuff. Is, is, yeah. On those heater units you're talk, you've got in there, mm -hmm. they look like the old radiators. That's right. so. Now are those more efficient than having a baseboard system uh, for it or what? Uh, so so basically the, the baseboard uses electric. No, yeah. I'm talking about the water. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I just know that these are strategically placed throughout you know, the, the floor plan. Okay. Um, you know, space, space for <coughs> that specific thing. Um, I guess, and then also, you know, you can see there's a lot of uh, louvers or I mean, sunshades. Are those movable? These are not. No, these are actually. Um, they, the angle of these are based on the trajectory of the sun as it comes across. And those are all things that you know we look at very at the very beginning of the project. Um so what next? Let's see. Oh, okay. Um okay, so then so so that so there's the twenty